between them and the dots on uh, great black Greek organizations that you all represent. Do we have representatives from all nine here today? Uh, see, there, there, there's, there's our first problem. There's our first problem. I've learned in life, the first thing you gotta do before you get anything done is show up. Is show up. In 21 years as an elected official, I've never missed one day of work. I've never missed one council meeting. I've never missed one day of legislative session. Because I believe if you're there in a the room, they can't pull anything over. So we gotta first show up. But for those of you who haven't shown up today and taking time out of your day to talk about civic engagement, what your organization represented, as you all might know, because of my attire, I am a five minute city. So Celebrate. I know, I know. Some of you guys wish you had done the right thing earlier. Uh, <laughs> I will celebrate next year uh, 40 years as a member of Five Big Sigma. I was in Charlotte and I was at San Diego State. And uh, yeah, I survived that. But my first foray really into elected office was being elected national director. Bigger and Better Business, 597, 1987. And I went to a national convention with no intention of running for office, got drafted, and uh, I was asleep in the back of the room when they announced that I, I had won. I was still count the vote, so uh, strange things happen for, uh, when you're not drunk. But I stand here today as an elected official, but again, my journey was not for public office. When I entered college, I was a biology major with every intention of going to medical school. And I realized my senior year, I would have my grad, uh, GPA, I wouldn't get nobody's medical school. So I had to either decide to repeat a lot of courses or uh, reverse courses and change my major. And I messed around and changed it to poli sci. It's been down here ever since. But uh, it's been a good ride. But again, black Greek letter organizations by nine, if we only understood our power, if we only understood the impact that we could have not only locally, on the state level, but on the national level as well, it would be impactful. And what I want to talk about is civic engagement. And not just showing up every now and then, waving, but I mean real engagement, working in campaign. Doing voter registration, I men, I believe they engaged that uh, doing voter registration drive and the whole panel and council. We need to make sure people that look like us are registered to vote. But more importantly than registered to vote, we gotta make sure they turn out to vote. We have midterm elections in November that are gonna be impactful throughout this state, throughout this nation. We also have an African American running for governor in Alabama, Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abel, and I'm pretty sure everybody in here got somebody from Alabama. <laughs> I mean, from Georgia, I should say. And Alabama, but somebody from Georgia in your family. But we need to be engaged in that region. So, well, I'm in California, what can I do? We can send money. We have the internet. You can get on social media and tell all your friends to vote for Ms. Abrams. Um, we can do phone banking. You can phone bank from anywhere. You know, you don't have to be in a campaign office to phone bank. You can phone bank from your house. There are now online applications where you can get the telephone numbers through the campaign, and they'll email them to you, and you can phone bank an hour per day, two hours per day, whatever your time permits you to do to have an impact. Because the difference in that race is going to be African Americans. The difference in that race, the difference in uh, November 16 was African Americans. We stayed at home. We stayed at home. That's why we have a mad man in the White House right now. And I've been around this business for 30 years, and this is not about Democrat or Republican, because I have plenty of my friends who are Republicans that are good people. Cheryl Underwood is a Republican. Raise his hell, but a good Republican. And, and, but it's not about party when you look at what we have in the White House. It's not. And I think John Kerry summed it up perfectly this morning, he says, he has the uh, uh, maturity of an eight-year-old boy and the insecurities of a teenage girl. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's nail on the head of what you're dealing with. Again, I, 
I've met many presidents. I, I, I've met two of the Bushes, met Barack before he was president. I met Barack when he was a state senator, just like me. You know, I've been to foreign countries and I've met prime ministers and I've met presidents in those countries. I meet you and met a relative. No one has to behave in the manner in which this individual does. So if it's nothing more, this should motivate us. Because you gotta read between the lines of what he's talking about making America great again. America was great when we were enslaved. America was great when there was Jim Crow. America was great when there was segregation. America was great for them was when you had, you can discriminate. But now we can live anywhere we want, pretty much do whatever we want to do, and we do less today. We do less today. We no longer depend on the black doctor. You can go to any doctor you want to. You know, you no longer depend on the black right leaders because you can take your St. John's to wherever else you choose to, you know, and get it clean. We don't depend on the black car mechanic. I'm pretty sure many of them don't even have black car anymore. You know what I'm saying? And we have to reinvest in our community. We got to start reinvesting in ourselves because if we don't, no one else will. And wanting parity and wanting equality, we should want that. You know, we, we shouldn't be afraid of being black. We shouldn't be afraid of embracing it. As I tell folks, we don't want any more than anybody else. We just should take anything less. And we're continuing to give handouts on all levels. I see it every day as an elected official. When I have to fight, I've done more diversity legislation than my white colleagues at Bradford. It's always about race. Well, it is about race. When you deal with 52 race cards, I want to play the game. Because that's all, really. When, when you look at the number of folks who are incarcerated in this country, even though we don't make up the majority of the population, we make the highest percentage of people incarcerated. And I'm pretty sure we're no more predisposed to commit a crime than anybody else. We're not. Let's look at what happened last week in Dallas, Texas. I, I would bet my life if she walked into that wrong apartment that she thought was hers, because I know she didn't have no Angela Davis and no power to the people pictures on the wall, that he probably had his apartment or anything after century to confuse it for hers and to shoot him dead. I assure you, if that had been a white man in that apartment, he would still be alive in death. I guarantee you would. And law enforcement always wants to say, oh, well, we train, we do it. They get it right in the white neighborhoods. They get it right in the white neighborhoods every day. One of the biggest pieces of legislation we had this year was 8931 by Dr. Shirley Weber, one of the baddest members of the California legislature, my former instructor at San Diego State. And I regret the day I dropped her class because she constantly reminded me, Bradford, if you stayed in my class, you would have been somebody. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, she had a bill on the use of deadly force by law enforcement and putting up new guidelines and procedures before you could draw your weapon and before you could fire your weapon and use of deadly force. And law enforcement wants to make it about training. And as I stated, you don't need training in a white neighborhood. Why do you need to be trained how not to deal with black and brown people in this country? But we had more pushback by law enforcement. And surprisingly, we had folks that look like us in the legislature who wasn't willing to vote for that bill. One of them was a cow. Uh, ooh, uh, but anyway. <laughs> but all that being said, if, if you understand the history of use of deadly force, you know when we instituted use of deadly force in America? Anybody know when? 1872. In 1872. So what happened in 1872 that was so different from the first hundred years as a country? Black folks were free. Really, black folks were free. This was seven years after the Emancipation Proclamation. If you look at American history, you'll see the rise in police forces grew as African Americans became free, as we migrated to urban areas. That was the growth of the police department. Before that, they didn't go get the corner sheriff or the constable, and he knew everybody in the town, and then all of a sudden, 
your police department grew leaps and bounds, and you had to institute in 1872 the use of deadly force. And I tell folks, if we knew our history, we would know the connections and understand why some of these laws are still in the books. So I would have to agree, after 140 years, I think it's time we need to do a reset. The law enforcement fought us to and now, in the last night of session, that bill died. We, we knew if we took it up on the assembly floor, it wasn't going to be the votes, and it surely wouldn't get over our eyes and get the votes to get to the governor's desk. So that bill died. But Shirley Weber is going to reintroduce it next year when we kind of end the legislative session. But black and white organizations, you guys need to weigh in. You need to be, you know, online, in the building, organizing your folks, saying we need to change this law. We really do. I mean, it's too many black kids, Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old playing by himself in the snow at a park, and a police officer pulls up, and three seconds later, he's pulled his gun and fired? <clears throat> Come on, if this doesn't enrage me, make me want to get engaged, I don't know what will. We are an endangered species. So, uh, I, I just want to not just talk about uh, law enforcement, but also, again, the importance of getting out and voting, registering to vote, volunteering on campaigns, and I don't know the membership of all these organizations, but we're all well and over 100,000 members of all these organizations collectively, right? We're all well over 100,000 members. Here's my challenge to the divine eye. Find just 1,000 members in each one of your fraternities and sororities. Just 1,000. Again, organizations with 200,000, 300,000 members, just find 1,000. Find 1,000 to write a $100 check. $100 check. That's $900,000. $900,000. Imagine the political impact you would have if you had a $900,000 annual cap. You should form the Divine Nine Political Action Committee and find just again a thousand members in each one of your organizations to make a hundred dollar commitment. And the commitment I'm making, if you do that, I'll put a thousand in. I will put a thousand in. But I challenge you, it won't happen. But if we did do it, and you hit nine hundred thousand dollars every year to play in political races, not only would you have gubernatorial gubernator, uh, uh, gubernator candidates knocking on your door, you would have presidential candidates knocking on your door, respecting the Panhellenic Council. They would. And we're not talking about a large number. We're talking about nine thousand members and writing a hundred dollar check and you would have a tremendous impact. Especially now in California and all these other states that are now trying to say, get corporate money out of politics. I find that the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard because corporate money, you can't win an election without PAC money. That's why corporations have their political action committee. So they can get their employees to put money in the PAC so they can will the millions of dollars that they put out every year to influence anything from legislation to who gets elected. If you want real power in politics, it takes three things. People, you got the people. Resources, you got to have resources, you have sorority housing, you have fraternity housing, where you can phone banking, you can open up satellite campaign offices, and money. Money is the mother's milk of politics. Money is what everybody respects in this business. And I guarantee you, if you guys raise $900,000 a year, everybody would look at it. everybody in this room, the whole lot different. They would give you Sigma, ABAs, Alphas, you know, Deltas, everybody different. Sigma got broke. They're going to say, it's going to look at you different. But we don't play like that. We complain, we go, woe is me, we show up, we do our Greek shows, and, and we don't see nobody. <laughs> One of my best days in the Capitol every year is when I see the APAs, the Deltas, and this year we had the Zetas in the building. It's nothing more empowering for me as a black legislator to see you guys in your colors, in your building, in that building, advocating for things that are important. You know who's missing? The men. My frat brothers, they're missing. But like I say, the Deltas, APAs, the Zetas, they show up. They show up and they have their legislative day in the Capitol. And you don't think people notice? When you guys are there, you're blue, white, you're red, and white, you're pink, you're green. You don't think people know this? But we got to show up. 
We got to show up, we got to be engaged, and we got to put our money behind, you know, where our mouth is. And it doesn't take a lot. Every time I talk about raising money, people, ooh, I don't have a thousand dollar check. Yeah, you don't have to write a thousand dollar check. Again, the power is in the numbers. Power is in the numbers. I always tell my friends, I can put a hundred folks that look like me in a room. I'm lucky if I raise ten thousand dollars. I put twenty folks that don't look like me in a room. I'm gonna raise no less than fifty thousand dollars. And do the math. We can do the same thing. We can do the same thing. We want to show up. We want to pay for our baby. We want to smile. We want to take a picture with the cat. We don't want to write checks. <coughs> you know. And that's what's going to make a difference. And I think if you guys form the national pack, the Pan-Atlantic Political Action Committee, I guarantee you, you would have greater impacts. And let me go back to Stacey Abrams in, uh, in Georgia. Every, I, I guarantee you probably have, what, 20,000, maybe 100,000 Greek members in, in, in Georgia? Imagine if all in a row for 100,000 children. She's coming to California next week. No, October 2nd. We're having a fundraiser for it over Michael Lawson's house in uh, Hancock Park. Um, Holly Mitchell, Sydney Conlogger, uh, going to be on another day. Uh, well, uh, is on the host committee, and we're going to show up. But she wouldn't be coming to California if it wasn't money given. You know? And when they get on a plane for $50,000, don't you think they would stay at home for 100? Yeah. You, a lot of candidates are running for statewide office. If you raise them, usually they're not going to get on a plane if they're outside the state for less than 50 grand. But we can do that. We can do that. If you would have those folks come to a Zeta, whatever, or the Pan Atlantic fundraiser, they would show up with bells on them if they knew there was going to be some money. Other than taking photos and, you know, glad. But that's what it's all about, folks. It's about being engaged. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for folks who looked like me and believed in me and got engaged. And I just don't see that political activism anymore. And, and it hurts me. Now many members of Maryland is a state and senate? 40. 40 in California. Know how many look like me? Five. Five? Five. I'm private president pro tem. We have five of like me. Two. Two. Me and Holly Mitchell. Me and Holly Mitchell. Now that we have total in the legislature? 11. 11. We had our all time high in 16 when we had 12. Shirley Brown out in the Inland Empire, but we lost that seat. We lost that seat. And we should have never lost that seat. We lost that seat. So now we have 11. Now that 11, we got two better cows. I mean, we're no, really. We, we, well, no, that's it. And me and Sigma, I think that's the only group we have. And then and, and I've got Sydney, who's the Zeta. So we got four people right there that are group, that are in the legislature. That, again, you got friends there, you got resources. But, you know, we, we just need to put our, uh, you, the muscle behind the organization. Make the organization mean something. Talk to John Lewis. Look at John Lewis. John Lewis was a college student during all of that civil rights movement, the march on Selma, the boycotts. It wasn't the old heads like us now, it was the young folks. So we need to go back and engage on these campuses and get these undergrads, understand the power of their voice, the power of organization, and coming together as a group. We have great strength if we only organize and utilize them in the right way. We have great potential. So I know you guys wanted some questions and answers, so I'm going to stop right here and uh, open it up for questions and answers. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, these immigrants uh, have outside. That is uh, something that the Black Caucus does in the Senate, which is we sometimes get the uh, you know, African American leaders of tomorrow. We hit that in um, was it July. We do it at Cal State Dominguez every year, we bring 100 young African-American, either high school seniors, juniors, or just re recently committed to college, uh, freshmen, and we have a three-day workshop where we bring in speakers from 
all over the state or all over the country in different industries. We also provide them with a scholarship and a laptop computer. And we would love your involvement in that too. We could use sororities and fraternities support there too. Because these young folks, hey, they haven't started college. They need to see what Greek life is all about. They need to learn what Greek life is all about. So we do that at Cal State and Minnesota. I think this is going to be our what, seventh year coming up, uh, and it's in a, what month of July? Hello? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> it was July, and Cal State the biggest years. So, yeah. That was what, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, I'm an American kid, so tomorrow. And some of the brightest young folks you could ever, uh, you know, hope to meet. Yes, ma'am. Serious. It, it, it can happen, and it should happen. 
Yes, ma'am. Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reprogram black folks to let them know that South Central does not exist because if South Central existed, we would have a North Central. Whenever you ever seen, I'm going to North Central alone. It doesn't, you know the origin of Central, Central Avenue and South Central? Y'all know? But a lot of folks don't. In the late 30s, they start pushing all the African Americans out of downtown LA. And they pushed them east of downtown and south. They said, you got to as far east as central. So they put us all on central. So when anybody came to town, you wanted to go to the Club Alabama or the Dunbar Hotel, they said, we're all the black folks. South on central. You'll find them all down there. Just keep driving south on. That's how we do it. So anyway.
breaks are seven. That's not closely close. The difference was LA County. In LA County, the difference in LA County was African American voters. Yes, ma'am. I wasn't an adapter. 
I wasn't an early adopter yet. I was like, yeah, we've seen that before. And I stand here today and say that was the best decision the California voters ever made. We would still probably be in a recession had Jerry Brown not been the governor and turned the keys over to somebody that didn't know how to govern. So Jerry Brown knows how to govern. So to Gavin's credit, he has a, a fine track record to follow. Jerry Brown has done great work. So if he just stays the course of what Jerry has done over the last eight years, I think he's going to be all right. And as for me, I hope he's arrested at some point. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure he's here to give you a hug. So.